to join me in standing to say the Pledge of Allegiance. I get a motion to accept tonight's uh, agenda? So moved. Um, Second. All in favor? Aye. That being said, though, I actually do, I, I see the comments for members of the community are, is after the presentation. I'd love to give an opportunity, seeing that we have some members here. Anybody would like to, to speak, um, you have an opportunity to go to the microphone and share your name. In three minutes, uh, I would ask you to keep your comments or questions to three minutes if anybody wants to share, and then we'll have an opportunity after the presentation as well. Once, twice, okay. Great, uh, in that case, we're uh, in a business meeting in which we will be having uh, a presentation about district long range planning. Uh, and uh, I'm very excited that uh, this is a sort of, uh, this is a new facet of, of our uh, dialogue, and I look forward to the presentation. Do we get to reference this or should we wait till later? <laughs> I'm very excited. Annually, uh, Raina makes yeah. us, uh, it is uh, banana bread. Banana yeah. bread. I take it home and it's usually lemon. It's, it's lemon? Lemon. 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 Who said banana? Lemon. David. Lemon. No, I'm lemon. sorry. English lemon. 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 I just said it the first thing that came to my mind. It's delicious, whatever yes. it is. Lemon. My mistake. Lemon and vanilla. It's but it's, it's I, I wouldn't know because I take it home and it's gone before I wake up in the morning. <laughs> so that's what I want to share. I'm going to hide it this night, this time when I go home. It's going to be a secret place. Thank you very much. So I hope everyone enjoys Dr. Kaur's cake, uh, what, whether this evening or over the holidays. Um, as Mr. Hanna indicated that this is a... Um, a new approach for us, um, a new presentation. Um, and I hope that my voice holds out, as you'll see yeah. tonight, that there's some uh, members of the board that are nearly without a voice as well. We hope not to pass that um, along the way. So we, we certainly will do our best uh, to get through. Um, but, you know, when we think about our strategic plan, we think about uh, the future, right? Obviously, you're thinking about moving towards the future. And in doing so, we want to make sure we're providing for the very best education for our students. It's not working. And, all right. Just out of the touch. All right, got it. So, and when we think about where we go, um, you know, we're. <laughs> there are six, right? So, um, each and every year, we're taking bold steps to further integrate the strategic plan, our vision for tomorrow. And in doing so, we're bringing to life the strategic objectives. And when we think of the objectives, they highlight what we believe in for the very best of our students. And I'm certainly not going to read to you, but there's words that should jump off of this screen to you. When we think of rigorous, comprehensive, enriched, diversified curricula, when we think about students achieving their personal best, and we think about enriched with technology, they should jump out of the types of experiences that we want for every student every single day here in Irvington. We want to ensure that we're encouraging innovation, creativity, and risk-taking within a d dynamic environment. But we also have to be quite mindful of what's happening within our schools, what's happening across society. And we want to make sure that we're fostering the social and emotional growth of all of our students to make sure that they're not only emotionally safe within our schools, but they're prepared to go out into society and be productive, contributing members of society. We need to support our staff members in doing so. So this board has stood up year over year and has supported professional development. And through the calendar this year, 
um, and looking at the introduction of PLRDs, the increased um, collaborative learning time, um, we see that coming through and through from an administrative recommendation with board encouragement to the actual action of it this year. We want to certainly continue to strengthen local connections and ownership of our schools, and that's through articulating our message and engaging folks in the community. But underscoring all of this is to make sure that the fiscal health is here, to make sure that we're able to provide for this learning experience. So at the end of the day, we could say that we want the world, that we want all of these opportunities for each and every one of our students, but we need to make sure we can pay for it today and that we put the district in a position that we can sustain it tomorrow. So as we've progressed in our work over the last few years, we see this alignment, the alignment that comes up between and among different areas of our work in the district. So for example, these are the overarching goals that exist within the district for this year. So we're thinking about strategic leadership and how we're implementing the strategic plan. And this today is a component of that. It's that idea of projecting and looking to the future. The idea of instructional leadership, what we're doing in the classroom, curriculum and instruction to improve and enhance experiences for students, and of course, the financial and operational leadership that I referenced just a moment ago. Over the course of the last couple years, there's been a question that's come up from the board and a question that I think it's really important for us to stop and answer. And it's that idea of what does it really take from a staffing perspective to be able to deliver our vision for tomorrow. So I might look at Mr. Hannes uh, smiling because it's a question that I know that he has answered and other uh, uh, trustees have echoed uh, throughout the past year. So tonight we wanna stop and we wanna be able to take a look at doing that. We wanna see what we think we need today to be able to fully deliver that vision. And also we step back and we think about, well, if we're gonna do that, what do our finances begin to look like? And, Ms. Stein has gone to great length to begin to start to look at long-range financial projections that can start to get us to think about years and years down the road. So with that said, of course, uh, where would we be if we didn't establish a goal? And then looking at our objectives for tonight, uh, we want to get an, understand, an understanding of, of where we're going, the things that we need uh, in our schools today to be able to support student growth, to be able to encourage the continued growth academically, and as we said before, social and emotionally. But in doing so, there's some um, questions that the board should keep in mind. We should think about budgetary allocations. We should think about goal priority and focus, and when we do so, we think about administrative goals, the goals that you set for me, the goals that we introduce in the district to ensure they align with that vision that we're talking about and the work that the board sets for itself. And then, of course, the alignment of the fiscal investments and in student needs. So when we step back and we think about what's happening in the classrooms, whether it is the need for enrichment, whether it's the need for additional classes, or it's the needs for other types of support, how are we aligning those resources to be able to serve the kids that are in our rooms today? So when we look at this, you know, there's a number of different pieces of work that are at play, and, and I think the slide should really stand out and speak to everybody in this room tonight. Um, we think of the, ce the center point of all our work being the strategic plan. Um, just last month, Dr. Kaur um, gave a tremendous presentation around um, the work that's occurring in curriculum and instruction. Um, she delved into what's happening um, and give windows in, not everything, but windows in to the great work that's happening in each of our schools at all the levels. Um, the work of our instructional coaches, the use of our program assessment model, the increased use of data in our schools. Um, so we see that work alive and well. Um, just in the last month, we also had a tremendous presentation from the Buildings and Grounds Committee um, and Ms. Stein and our partners at H2M Architects talking about the capital and facility needs for our school district. So we know we're focusing on the physical plant. We know we're thinking of doing that. Um, and then we look at technology. It's been discussed in this room. We had a great presentation from Mr. Levinsky and Dr. Kaur earlier in the year. And that one of our objectives later this year, this spring, is to, to, to update our district technology plan. So we look at these key components of planning for the future, plans that are in place that guide education for our kids, that all tie into the financial well-being. But the one thing we haven't stepped back and looked at is where we go in long-range staffing. And that's where some of our focus is going to be this evening. 
So that said, I, I think it's almost important to jump into this um, with some disclaimers. Um, that we need to be able to frame this. And we have to recognize, as Ms. Stein will get into, that a, that a budget is really dynamic in a school district environment. It's dependent on so many different factors. Um, but we will look at this as what our potential needs are. And I look to my colleagues um, that are in the room. Um, this work that you're seeing tonight has come from months worth of work from all the administrators in the district. So we're really putting a lot of hard thought into what we need to be able to deliver the level of education that our children deserve. But I want to underscore that point that's listed up on the slide right now, that these aren't budgetary recommendations right now. Some of these certainly will surface through our budget process when we're looking to 1920, um, but others we know aren't going to get there because they need to be reviewed on an, an annual basis. Uh, needs are dynamic, right? They shift be based upon what's happening in our classrooms, students that enroll on a daily basis, and we need to make sure we're responsive to them. We also have to step back and, and we look at where we stand from um, fiscal efficiencies and evaluating the work that we do today, the staffing structures that we have, to see if the models that we have in place really are serving the district as well as they could. And we have a couple examples where we're going to dig in through the course of this year and potentially come up with some proposals that may result in staffing shifts, that may result in realignment of responsibilities and duties to make sure that you're getting the best product for your school district, for your community. Um, and as we come forward with presentations, whether it's in the 1920 budget process or in years to come, that we're going to look to come forward with data to support the rationale as to why we need them. We're going to look to come with other rationale, whether it's anecdotal or otherwise, to help you understand why we see this dramatic need or this dire need to support our kids in the ways that we're recommending. So here we are, talking about staffing. Um, and Dr. Kaur is going to jump in and help me through um, a percentage of this um, component of the, of the evening. And then Ms. Stein is going to jump in and, and begin to talk about uh, finances and looking big picture for finances. Um, so when we think about where we are, um, we recognize that there's, there's obviously lots of work that goes into it, and we have a tremendous administrative team um, that digs in every day, that the, the boots on the ground and understand what the student needs are, what faculty needs are, program needs are. Um, so this work began months ago with conversations at the administrative council level, so it's all the administrators in the district, and then it evolved into a series of meetings over the course of uh, the month of November where uh, Raina, Carol, and I met with each of the department and school leadership teams to be able to identify what they saw uh, as their needs. We didn't want to have group think. We wanted to make sure they were authentic and unique to what was happening locally in each school. If we sat in an administrative council room, it would be easy for everybody to kind of start to jump on board and say, yeah, me too, or yes, we're seeing that as well. We wanted to come real life out of those experiences that they're living day in and day out, supporting the growth and success of those students. Um, and very uniquely though, um, and it, maybe it's, it's the work that we've done over recent years, we consist consistently tout the fact that we've become um, really gelled as a strong K-12 system, um, that a series of themes very clearly emerge from school to school to department to department. And the focus, most notably, jumped out being student-centered, right? Instruction as a first area. And you can see areas of alignment with our strategic plan. Thinking about social-emotional learning for all of our students. Pupil per personnel services, which includes special education. Uh, technology. And technology, we could have folded into instruction, but it became a real defined need that we thought it was important to be able to break out because there's dis different uh, budgetary components that we had address. Um, athletics, um, and I say athletics, and I can tell you, like when we created this slide a week ago, um, I wanted to make sure that we didn't like overstep and think, well, no one's thinking about the arts. The arts actually are unfolded into some of the conversation that Dr. Kaur will speak to regarding instruction. Um, safety and security, um, you know, we, we know that is the, the focal point of that capital work that I referenced a few minutes ago. Um, but it needs to f fall in here because there's work that we need to do that's on the staffing front that cannot be captured within a public bond vote. And then things that are more global on a district level. 
Um, so with that said, I invite Dr. Kaur to jump in um, to walk us through some of the focal points related to instruction. No, I, I'm, I'm okay. I could use this mic. So good evening, everyone. Um, I am happy to actually be having this conversation tonight. I think it has been um, long in coming. We've been talking about how do we know? How do we know when we have enough staff? When will it ever end? Um, so I don't know that we know that it will ever end, but I think that we can certainly create a frame that says how do we make, how does decision making happen? And I think in any given year, um, we're always subject to where we are with budget, what we can afford, um, what the needs are. You know, one of the things that um, we've talked about over the years, and I'll just move to this first area, is this focus on instruction. And you might think that what we want to talk about are the specifics of instruction, but actually, as a team of administrators, uh, we spend a tremendous amount of time negotiating the, um, the challenges of shared staff. And so we felt like if we're looking and we're talking about long-term planning, one of the challenges of being a small district like Irvington is we end up with shared staffing. And this, that could mean one of two things. It could mean somebody who is um, going from just between the campus, middle school and high school, but it, we also have situations where we have um, personnel who are going between Main Street, middle school, and high school. Um, not so much shared over the years. We've actually also had staff that shared between Dow's Lane and the high school. Um, I don't think at this point we have anybody who does that, um, has that job. So what we have found over the years are a couple of different things. One is retaining part-time staff. So in an effort to not necessarily have a shared staff member or because of our needs, we've hired part-time people. So these two topics sort of overlap, shared and part-time. And um, I want to start with part-time. So we have had some success with part-time. I'll give a, an example. Uh, we have a band teacher now who we originally hired. I remember us sitting in this room saying, who are we going to get to do a point four music position? And lo and behold, we found an amazing person to take that position. But one of the things that happened was shortly after hiring him as a point four, we made it a full-time position. So we have found that there are times when we have started with a part-time position and shifted to full-time, we have maintained or, or we have kept that person or the, the um, yeah, the person that we hired in that position. So in that case, it worked out for us. We also have several examples of where we had part-time positions that did not go full-time. And what has happened and continues to happen for us is it is a revolving door. So we can give the example certainly of French over the years is probably, it's probably our worst example of how many people we had come through the door, hired part-time, and ultimately move on. I believe they're all in Scarsdale at this point. Um, but that was our loss. Um, and I think that at the time we felt that we couldn't increase the staffing and we understood that that wasn't a possibility, but as a result, we, we lost people. The number of hours that go into hiring of our administrators is noteworthy. So from the beginning steps of looking at resumes, which can be many, um, um, having screening interviews, committee interviews, and dem demonstration lessons, uh, the candidates meeting with Dr. Harrison, it is hours and hours and hours for each position. So there's also a loss here that is often not identified or recognized, but the hours of investment in hiring part-time staff is really, uh, of hiring any staff member is significant. When you have a situation where it's a revolving door, it becomes even more significant. In addition, um, we don't get a pool, we don't get the strongest pool of candidates because nobody is leaving a full-time tenured position in another district to come to Irvington for a part-time position. Obviously, um, nobody would do that. So sometimes what happens is we get somebody um, who we've had where someone's returning to the workforce, for instance. They've shifted jobs, their career changes, and they're happy again to start with the part-time, but within a couple of years tops, we're hearing the mantra of they're really looking for a, um, a full-time position. So that's one scenario that I would say when we look at long-term planning, it would be a scenario that we would work very hard to try and eliminate. Um, again, sometimes challenges of certification. So if you don't have the sections, you don't have the, what, for the person, what the person can do, you can't justify having that person. So I think that 
there are times where we have been able to open doors and opportunities. I think PLTW is a good example of that. Our technology program, we were able to expand our program. So considering the options for expanding our program is one avenue to pursue when thinking about how do we reduce that idea of part-time or shared staff. I want to talk for a second specifically, though, about the shared staffing um, concern. So right now, we have, uh, we have several members of staff members who are shared. They move across the district. One piece of a shared staff member, or one um, um, thing that's noteworthy, is if I'm a staff member who is shared, I don't have to do a duty. So our teachers do duties in our buildings. So if you're shared, you need travel time. So we always lose time because somebody does need that sufficient travel. And if they're traveling sometimes back and forth, um, we need to give them even more travel time. In addition, um, it makes scheduling really, really difficult. So I would say um, really kudos to all of our administrators because the conversations, if you could be a fly on the wall when we're doing scheduling and working things out, you can't believe the hours that are spent amongst the administrators who share this staff to try and figure it out. Our goal is to not have a staff member traveling back and forth multiple times during the day. I mean, that's in our minds, doesn't even seem like a, a, a fair design of a position, and certainly not professional, to constantly be jumping back and forth. Um, but in addition to that, um, functioning on A and B days, switching schedules. Every, every one of our schools runs special programs, has special days, whether that be an assembly schedule, whether that be um, a club schedule, or um, a special event schedule. And I'm thinking of Main Street Middle School and High School. And every time that happens, if I am a shared staff member, my day is completely blown up in the sense that I'm supposed to be at the middle school, but, I'm, but my time is still um, not fulfilled at Main Street School or at the high school. So I can't, um, I can't really say enough about the complexity of having shared staff. And I think we would like to work really hard moving forward to how, do we, how can we consider ways to eliminate shared staffing um, a, especially, I would say, from Main Street School to the campus, um, but even across the campus running different schedules, um, which we've done for years, makes it really, really complex. So this is a really important um, screen for us because as we go through each year, uh, we, we're going to bring this slide back up every time to say, wait a minute, let's not forget in our future planning, this is a priority for us as administrators that if we're going to be running good systems, good, um, good schedules, and supporting students in all capacities. This is really um, something that uh, brings a lot of challenge for us. Do you want me to just, I'm just gonna keep going. And, okay. um, so world language, so tonight we are sharing um, a, a copy of the elementary world language proposal. Um, my suggestion would be is if we could wait until, rather than stop everything, I would love to just keep going with the, at least this set of slides and then if we want to circle back. Um, so as we know, we've had a... <laughs> um, there's been some interest around world language. Um, we've had a lot of interest around world language, and it's certainly something that has lived on in Irvington for a lot of years. Um, we're excited. We've, we've invested a lot of time and energy and um, talked about um, with our world language committee of teachers what, what is possible and what we think is viable and what we feel that we can offer to the board and to the community as, a, as an approach to including world language in our, um, in our schools, in both Dow's Lane and Main Street School. Um, so more to come on that. Um, you know, I would say that we've had a lot of conversations in, these, in our past years in budget around special education and the needs in our buildings. I don't think that you can pick up a newspaper or a magazine, uh, a periodical these days where we're not talking about the needs of kids, um, the, the just shift in the approach, um, more and more needs, students coming into our schools, not just Irvington, all schools, um, with an expectation that we can educate a large range of students, meeting a large range of needs. And as a result, we have increased our opportunities. I think that we would say, certainly from last year, we would say we were proud of a program that we've been able to maintain at the middle school, not only because we are meeting the needs of, our, or of the students in our community, um, but also it was at a, at a cost savings for us. And you know, I guess it, that's, that in some ways is the perfect world, right? We, we need to be fiscally responsible, but we need to meet the needs of the students who live in our community. Um, so we're very proud of the work and the expansion. I would say that 
Um, we have expanded our um, special education programs and for whatever reason, we did ask for um, a special ed teacher last year, special education teacher last year at the middle school and it didn't make it through the budget. But what's happening is we're seeing shifts in what we're providing at the elementary school and the middle school has not really expanded to provide the same level of support for our students. So as a result this year, we ended up um, increasing our number of six period classes because we still, the, the kids still come every day and so we still needed to actually serve their needs but we didn't have the right staffing in place for that. So I think we came up with a really good solution for this year and we're proud again of, of how we're meeting the needs of our students. But again, this is a long range plan. This isn't a budget presentation. So this is what we're saying to the board and community is we see it, we see the need here. We have not, um, we have not broadened the range of what's available at the middle school in a way that's really meeting our students' needs um, as well as supporting um, our teachers and how much they can actually accomplish in, the, in, the, in a given day. When we increase to a six period class, while in some ways that seems like a good solution, that's a teacher who now has an additional class, an additional responsibility. From an organizational structure, that teacher doesn't do a duty. So if I'm looking at our, at our building administrators who um, scramble to make sure they have enough teachers to cover the duties that happen every day in the middle school and high school, well, every time a teacher does a six period class, they don't have a duty. So that takes that teacher out of the pool and is not a resource for, um, for the duties that we, demand, that we require in um, the schools. So the expansion and the looking at the two special ed teachers is really to address a situation that we currently have as far as staffing, but also to ensure that we're providing the um, educational um, and meeting the educational goals of, of the students in, our, in the middle school. Um, I don't think there was an administrator who walked through the door who didn't um, sing the praises of our social worker, Gina Menendez. She, she is a miracle worker. <laughs> she is just incredible. She works in every building. She works with every administrator. Um, she is truly a gift to our district. But one social worker, K-12, is just doesn't meet the needs. The growing emotional needs of, of students the growing needs of families is just, um, again, not just in Irvington. We're seeing it in all of, we hear it from all of our colleagues. It's not just in Westchester, it is across this country that the growing demand of um, the social emotional support for both students and families is, um, has grown exponentially. And at this point, one social worker, which by the way, we have had um, in district I don't know, for, for as long as I could remember, and then we went for a while without a social worker. Um, we were lucky to get, I don't, Gina's four, is this her fourth, fourth year? Um, but clearly, our, every administrator came through the door saying, it's just not enough, and, and we need that level of support. Um, another area that we've talked about, and, and I share this one with, um, with mixed emotions. Um, having an, a campus dean or some role on our campus to support the needs of discipline. And you know, discipline goes um, far and wide. So I'm, I don't love using the word discipline because I think it implies one thing and I think we treat it as something very different. I think that when a student or a child, and I'm gonna say a child, does something that is out of sync with the norm of maybe what the rest of our students are doing in our buildings, it demands a level of care that is far and above what the word discipline would imply. It means it's an outcry. It's something that's saying, I need something and I'm not getting what I need. And so the behavior may be a behavior that we find needs some disciplinary action. But the overall need of the child is actually, generally, leans right back into the social emotional support that we need to be giving to all of our students. And while some students may cry and some students um, may do very, may demonstrate risky behaviors and some students might um, hit another student, whatever that is, it actually all leads back to the same thing, which is, I need help, I need support. Um, when we look at our building administrators, um, the reality is they have a lot on their plates as far as running buildings, observation and evaluation, and discipline can be all-consuming. 
So when something happens with a particular student, it could, it could result in a full day of an investigation. It could result in, in a hearing. It could result in um, extensive conversations for our administrators with parents, with students, with other students. One of the things that we're finding is that it is very challenging to be proactive. It is very challenging to have those components in place with the staff that we currently have, which is our four administrators at the, um, at the, on the campus. So one idea, and I share that I think is the word idea, because I think that we recognize that there's a need. Um, I'm gonna share, actually, when Matt Samuelson and I had that conversation about it, one of the things he said is, you know, I, I have mixed feelings about it. He said, one of the ways that I get to know kids and I support kids is sometimes through that discipline is through my interaction with students. So I don't, we don't put this up there as some simple solution like let's just hire a dean. It would require a lot more conversation, but it is in recognition of behaviors, needs. Um, I think who could be, you know, a high school parent who isn't worried about kids vaping. I mean, there's a lot going on out there in this world right now. And so we're just saying, we're recognizing there is some other need. And what that is, I think, is also hinges on some of these other positions. So it's not that we need everything. We need a game plan. We need to say, here, what are the needs and how do we get there? I hope what you're seeing on this slide is some, a theme. It's a theme that says, how are we supporting our students? Um, a behaviorist right now, we engage, we have a consultant who comes in and functions as a behaviorist. She provides. Um, regular support, so she's in our building, she supports all of our buildings, and um, it is a very, very specific skill set that a behaviorist brings. So it's not just that we would have a special education teacher who, who has that skill set. A behaviorist is somebody who is prepared to not only work with a particular student, but we also look to them as a coach for coaching our administrators and teachers in, in how to react, how to, um, how to address students, and ultimately, um, sometimes, what do you do in a crisis situation when a, ch when a child really is in crisis? So um, right now, again, we have somebody who's coming in, but a behaviorist would be something that we could benefit from K through 12. When we look at a second elementary counselor, we thank, we'll start by saying thank you. We love that you have given us that first elementary counselor. As you know, it's part of the state regulations. We are required as of September to um, provide instruction at the K-5 level. We are um, so appreciative that we have someone in place who is going to be part of the K-12 planning. So that come September, we feel that as in Irvington, we really are ahead of the game. I, th I saw recently there was um, a question from other elementary schools, do you have a counselor, do you have a counselor? And while there are many that do, there are many that don't, and they're now trying to gear up for next September. So we appreciate that. We anticipate, again, with the needs that a second counselor, um, there would be benefit to a second counselor. Um, speaks to instruction in the classroom, speaks to being proactive, speaks to um, working with small groups of students, um, running groups that would be different than what a school psychologist would engage with students in. So we see lots of opportunity. Again, anything that you're seeing here tonight, we're, we would be prepared to share with you in more, with more specificity, but we're trying to give you an overview of what does the future look like and what might be some of the options. Um, K-5 resource teacher. So right now, we have a system where if you're a student at the elementary level, you're basically either in an classroom, talk classroom, or we have a special class. Um, there's a whole level of support called resource room, and we provide it actually at the high school. Um, that really allows us to have a student in the least restrictive environment, but still providing the support for their um, IEP goals. And it has been a missing component at the elementary. We had it when I first came here, I want to say. Um, it's been a missing component now for many years and it would um, open the door. It would possibly give us a way, for instance, to maybe reduce the number of students possibly in an, in an ICT classroom. Um, so sometimes we run two ICT sections on a grade level. Well, possibly if we had a resource room, maybe we wouldn't have to do that. Right now, we're a little restricted in where we're able to um, put our students so that they're getting the, the um, appropriate support. Um, we continue to evaluate opportunities to implement new programs that will reduce the need for out-of-district. 
We, as we've shared, we have several examples um, now of our special classes where not only are we maintaining and, and being able to keep our kids in, in district, which is our goal, but also how do we open those doors and spots so that other districts are coming to us. We had many years where districts did seek us out and, and we had many out of district students in some of our special programs. Uh, we continue to look to expand that and, and provide the opportunities for districts to um, see Irvington as a place to go, but mostly because we want to be able to provide that for our own students. So um, I, I think that I heard someone say pie in the sky when um, they asked for this presentation. Um, and so there you go. Technology integration coaches, all four we'd love. Um, so technology integration coaches. Um, we have been really fortunate that our three current coaches all see um, technology just as a part of their daily life. They infuse it, they um, certainly um, access technology, they're all using data, they're all doing data analysis for us, but this is different. Um, so whether it, we end up asking for actual technology coaches, I think that's another question that we have, like what are they, what would we be calling them? But we need the support, or I, I shouldn't say we need, we would benefit from the support of um, professionals who come and can work with teachers on the integration of technology specifically. Our coaches now are do that, but only when it, if it works out that way, not because that's their goal. So we would love to see, um, there's an increase in expectations, there's certainly an increase in um, devices, and um, as we move to more and more devices, we certainly see that while some teachers are off and running and they're happy at 11 o'clock at night to be Googling at home how to do something or playing around with something, I would not say that's the norm. Um, so we have lots of classrooms where I think we would like to see more technology and we'd like to see it integrated um, thoughtfully um, with high expectations for learning that meets our strategic objectives and the goals. Um, so to do that, we truly believe that we need the support. Um, Jesse, as you've heard us say before, is a little bit of a one-man show. Um, he provides some professional learning when possible, but the expectation that Jesse would be coaching in classrooms side by side is unrealistic compared um, in light of all of the other responsibilities. Um, so there was a time when we actually had a computer aid in all of our and somewhere along the way, through budget cuts, we reduced it. And so we have one computer aide who is shared between K-5 and another person who is shared 612. The computer aide provides um, all kinds of support for us. And um, we, not only do they sometimes, they provide technical support, they provide a lot of logistics support for teachers. It's not the instructional component that they always provide, but they do provide, they do get things ready so a teacher is able to. It's ensuring that the Chromebook card is ready and, and plugged in so that when a teacher gets it, all of a sudden they don't have like 10 dead Chromebooks because the person before didn't plug in the card or didn't plug in those particular Chromebooks. So there is a lot of logistics that go on that if teachers knew that they could access the technology and it would work, they would also be more, more readily um, able to just jump in at the, at the beginning of that period. So increasing our technology aids would give us a lot of support in both um, hardware, instructional, um, and just the overall organization of all of our buildings. Yeah. So I don't, do you want me to, do you want to go back to this now before we move yeah. on to yeah, that? that? Okay. So, um, I don't know if people have these. Can you pass it down? So, um, tonight is the unveiling of the Elementary World Language Proposal. So I do just want to take a couple of minutes on this. Um, it feels like, I, I don't want to make it seem that we are lobbying for this in some way over anything else that's on the screen. I think it's kind of just fell that we said we were going to do it and we were gonna do this, and here it is the same night. So being that it's here the same night, I might as well just touch on it. So um, the elementary world language proposal, this I'm not gonna read to you. I think this proposal gives you a nice overview. I like the fact that we're able to share it tonight because I'm guessing that in an upcoming board meeting, we may have some parents who would like to come and ask some questions um, once they've had a chance to read it. Maybe, Karen, I don't know, maybe. 
Maybe that'll happen. Um, but we're excited. We sat together um, over several day, over several meetings, and we really talked about Irvington, what's viable. We had the world language, our 612 world language chair was part of this. So on the front page, you can see the participants. We tapped people who were interested. Um, but our goal was to be able to come forward and say, should this be something that we can work into our budget? Here's what we think could work in our schools. And you know, one of the things that I, that's worth noting, um, as you look at this, which is um, the suggestion is once a week um, as part of a specials rotation. One of the things that we thought was this to someone might seem like, oh, it's not enough. I want to highlight um, the expansion that we've had in our clubs, the expansion in our after school programs. We deeply believe that having language experience is important in Irvington. We also know what the realities are of what we can fit in a school day um, and, and what we can afford. And so with that, um, we started to actually talk about our art program and we talked about the influence that taking art every single year, that when our kids get to middle school, they really come to sixth grade having a very broad experience in art and, and a level of preparedness to do the kind of artwork that um, I know that is expected from you know, Mr. DiBenedetto and um, Ms. Rossi and, and uh, Ms. Schmertz. And that's a result of the K-5, it's a result of articulation. Um, Nina Rossi is our department chair, has worked really hard on that. But it's also, um, that experience that a child gets when they're five and then again at six and seven and eight and that means something and that for most kids that is a significant um, experience that they can look back on and so with that when we started to say wow like if I'm a child or I'm a student in Irvington and every year I'm getting a language experience by the time I get to sixth grade I really should feel like I know I'm I I am deeply aware of the cultures, I am knowledgeable, I am aware, I should say, of the language. We are not expecting fluency. As you read through this proposal, we don't expect our students to leave fifth grade as, speak, as speaking um, the language, but we do expect them to have had an experience that prepares them for sixth grade in a very different way. Um, we had some conversations about what could potentially happen two or three or four years down the road. Should we do this? Because any program we implement should be an evolution. We, sh we don't want to put something in and say, this is the way it's going to be forever. We want to say, this is what we're able to do now to begin to expand the opportunities for our students. So we hope as you read this proposal that you, um, <coughs> that you capture the essence of that, that this would be a starting point and something that we would continue to evaluate and reevaluate over the years and, and hopefully um, grow in, in terms of what we're doing and what we're able to do. Um, but most importantly, that our students really leave elementary school feeling, an, feeling a connection to, um, and you'll see we did both Spanish and French, and I think that we felt that that was important, knowing that those are the two languages that we offer in middle school. It felt important that we give both experiences, especially because we're not, when you do an immersion program, you have to pick, basically. We, if doing this, it also opened the door for, for us to not have to pick. So I'm, I'm excited to share this with you, and I look forward to getting, um, hearing your feedback, and um, also the community feedback on this. Great, thank you, Dr. Kaur. Um, just as before I talked about our capital project, which has a focus on safety and security, uh, we recognize that the security of our students, and I need to underscore, and our staff, um, doesn't end just by putting up doors and locks and fancy electronic or digital devices. Um, there's a human factor that goes with security, and we've done a lot in the past year to change behaviors in the schools, and from the sign-in protocols and procedures to guests wearing different colored lanyards and changing the practices, in and around our emergency drills. Um, but there's a lot of other things that we need to consider doing uh, to be able to support um, having a more safe school environment. Um, so going back about four years ago, um, we added security guards at each of our schools. Um, we currently have five guards um, that are positioned at schools. Uh, one um, near the district office is a clerical employee that serves the role as a greeter. Uh, but then we also have two roving guards um, on the campus that are actually have routines where they set up and they have particular patrols 
where they go to certain areas at certain times, they observe certain types of behaviors, they're in communication with school administration, and then they support us during um, traffic hours as do our other security guards. But once the students go home, when the school day ends, what happens? Our guards go home. But we have many students that are still here engaged in activities, whether that's extracurricular, athletic programs, music programs. Uh, we have staff members that are staying late. Um, how do we provide security? Um, whether it's signing somebody in or just another set of eyes to make sure um, that there's no funny business going on in the hallways or to keep an eye open for something suspicious. So we need a consideration to think about what does it look like to be able to have security support while our schools are in operation. And that looks different in each building. So when we picture the campus, we know the Mar Gym, we know the campus gym, we know the theater are open late hours. We know that the uh, at Dow's Lane, um, sometimes the Dow's Gym is used, Main Street, sometimes the Main Street Gym is used. So how do we be flexible enough just not to have a one-size-fit-all solution for this, but have an approach that be able to provide that level of support and accountability and supervision when there are events in the evening to make sure we have secure spaces for our students and our staff members. Um, I referenced the Main Street School gym uh, just a short time ago. And as everyone in the room knows, it's a standalone building. And it's um, a place that's quite isolated. Uh, so when we think about our children down there with one uh, great phys ed teacher, uh, the challenge is, is that you only have one adult with a group of children. And what if there was an emergency? What if there was a significant injury? How do you be able to provide care when you're in a remote situation like that? Um, with that in mind, we think it's quite responsible to be able to provide another aid, um, another responsible adult to be of assistance, um, to not only be able to enrich the PE program, but to be able to be responsive and support kids and the PE teacher during any type of crisis situation, whether that's a drill, whether that's an injury, or any other type of emergency event that could occur. Um, when I get to the next item, I look directly to Ms. Stein. Um, from a school district standpoint, and as your superintendent, I can tell you I'm proud of the work that we've done on the safety front in the past six months. Um, definitely, we've taken steps along the way through my seven years here in the district, um, whether that's through the addition of security guards, whether that's amping up the drills and um, putting state-of-the-art pro emergency protocols in place. Uh, but this year, we really pivoted, and we took great, great steps to make sure our schools were safer for our students and for our staff, and in doing so, has put a tremendous burden on every one of the administrators in the room. And while we're proud of the work that we've done, and I say this, removing the whole facility discussion that you know that's happening, that uh, Mr. Friedman and the Buildings and Grounds Committee led um, at the last meet, or two meetings ago, last meeting, um, that there's a lot more work to be done. There's a lot of work to be done. At the last board meeting, I, I spoke uh, proudly about our work when we had a scary situation that occurred where there was a stabbing in Dobbs Ferry and the alleged perpetrator ran into Irvington and we did a tremendous job and so my shout out to my all my colleagues in the room that were involved um, that day um, and accounting for our students accounting for our staff organized a reunification program that was consistent with our emergency protocols in the district um, having efficient communications on, on the school district side um, but it happened at just the right time when we step back and I look around the room and think who was here. Uh, if it had happened a few minutes later, folks could have been on their way home. Um, district office staff, I looked at Dr. Kaur and Ms. Stein and uh, Mr. Knowles, our facilities director. They were all sitting in my office with me as we were mapping out the responsibilities and what needed to be done. And then everybody in the field doing all the good work to protect our kids and our, and our colleagues. Um, but there's a lot more that we need to do on the safety and security front to make sure that our schools are safe. And quite frankly, um, we don't have the expertise uh, to be able to do so. And most importantly, we don't have the time. Uh, Ms. Stein, Mr. Knowles, and I can go to every workshop under the sun, and I can tell you, um, if we receive five emails a day, we receive 20 emails a day about a webinar, about a conference related to school safety and school security. And I tell you, when you click delete at the end of the night on those emails, you feel guilty because you know you want to be at every single one of them. 
but there isn't time in the day. Um, so how do we do all this work? How do you plan? We managed a, a reunification where we had dozens of students involved, but how do you manage a reunification when you have thousands of students involved? How do you manage a disaster and have triage centers set up? How do you handle mass communication with hundreds of families at a time where each student is in a different situation? Um, we can't do that with the capacity that we have here today. Um, so we have a tremendous need um, to be able to look at a safety coordinator type position. And you know, as Dr. Kaur said before, we're not necessarily putting priority on items today. But I would tell you personally, um, this is something that, that is of, a, of importance. I would also say that there's opportunities that are out there that uh, where we can look at a situation where it is a COSER or a BOCES aidable positions that exist where you have folks that are trained and experts in this area. And it's an area for a shared service where we have other school districts that are in the same exact position. And when Ms. Stein and I started the conversation and we started talking with our colleagues, her with the business officials and me with the superintendents, within about a week's time, we had two other districts call us and say, can we get together and talk about this a little bit more? Because we feel the same way. Um, so we're excited that right after break, we're actually meeting with two other school districts to see how this model could work um, and looking at how we could potentially share costs to make our schools uh, safer for our students and our staff. Um, when we talked about, I referenced athletics before, and um, Dr. Kaur uh, spoke about shared staff. Um, the one area that we spoke to and we think of there is our arts program and being able to sustain the high quality program and expectations that we have for our kids to develop student artists. Uh, so our focus on our arts and our music program was alive and well in that conversation. Um, but when we step back, we recognize that a large number of our middle schoolers and our high schoolers participate in our athletics program. And when we think about where we are today, um, there's a couple challenges that are there. We're tremendously grateful for the improved facilities that we have. Um, Ms. Arrows Field, Oli Track are outstanding. Um, the new East Field is, is, is gorgeous. And now with East Field online, we're going to see our other fields shaping up and, and looking better every single day. Um, but now we start to look around the edges and the things that we need. And in our capital project work, we talked about storage. And storage is, is a key. But when we think about from where we are from a personnel perspective, um, the, our athletic trainer, which started off um, with 25 hours a week and has grown to already how many hours now? 50 hours a week. Um, we have one trainer that is supporting all of our student athletes. And when we think of the routine bumps and bruises, a twisted ankle, a sprained wrist, um, cuts and bruises that occur in competition, um, we need folks there to be able to treat and care for our student athletes. But when we think about our, tr our growing concerns around more traumatic injuries such as concussions, um, we have an expert on hand and an expert um, that we would like to be able to keep with us. The challenge that we have is that right now it's a fiscally responsible decision um, that we outsource the service today through a physical therapy service and we're fortunate to have a gem, a true, true lifesaver, no pun intended, um, and, and, a, and a great um, employee. Our concern is that um, just knowing the market, it's, be able to, it's difficult to be able to maintain consistency there. And that we would, our student athletes would benefit from having someone that was committed to the district. And not only from a care perspective on the field, but the role that they would play during the school day and be able to offer educational programs, connect with our health programs, and support our student athletes throughout the school day. Um, finally, when we think about our athletics program, um, we have challenges from time to time because we don't have dedicated buildings and ground staff. Um, in past budget presentations, we have talked about um, difficulties and the limitations that we have with the bare bones staff available. Um, we've talked about the ability to be able to support our operational needs with actual maintenance mechanics, and we've been fortunate enough to add two of them in the past couple of years, and those individuals actually pay for themselves. Rather than actually contracting services out, we've hired our own experts, our own maintenance employees that do far more work than we would be able to do on the same dollar with hiring electricians or carpenters to come in and, and manage um, needs that we have in our district. Um, so when we think about where we are, 
Today, our athletic program has needs too, and we think about the quality experience that we afford our students. Unfortunately, it's all too common to arrive at one of our sporting events and see our students and our coaches rather than warming up or engaged in practice or preparing for a competition, that they're actually out there setting up their own field. Uh, because the same folks that are cutting the grass, the same folks that are raking the leaves, um, that are working in our buildings, are caring for our athletic program. Um, so that idea of having a point person to be able to support our programs if something went wrong with a field or facility, to have someone ready and able, equipped with tools and the skill and knowledge to be able to support the operation of the program would be critical. So stepping back and thinking about where we are on a district level, um, and I, I will jump down to the second item uh, before getting to the first uh, to consist, keep up with that um, custodial theme. Um, you know, we have um, challenges when we think about um, our work with any kind of substitute position in a school district. Um, we had conversation in this room uh, back over the summer about increasing our substitute teacher rate. Uh, recognizing that we weren't competitive with surrounding school districts and wanting to make sure that we had quality substitutes available and enough substitute of it, substitutes available to cover our classrooms. It's no different with the custodial pool. Uh, when we have uh, folks that are out and out for contractual days off or sick days, uh, we need to be able to cover their spots because things need to be fixed, areas need to be cleaned, and that doesn't stop uh, when they're absent. So if we don't have a substitute, actually what happens is that we have a position where we're bringing folks in and we have an overtime situation, uh, which obviously costs the district much, much more money. Um, so we've developed the idea of looking at a, lead, a floating lead custodian position that can assist our head custodians to cover special projects, um, that can support um, our head custodians when they're out, because currently when we have a head custodian that's out, um, that we don't have someone to step up without leaving their other building to be able to go support any needs that may arise at a particular school. And we have a tremendous custodial staff here in the <laughs> Irving schools, and I give each and every one of them the accolades. You see them on your way out, give them a pat on the back because they're, they're an awesome group. Um, but we could use two, three, four more of them uh, each and every day. Um, and stepping back and thinking about the district office and the district function, uh, so when you think of the district office, you may think of uh, Carol, Raina, myself as, as the face of the office. Um, we have a few other people behind us, but only a few other people that are really tremendous, talented individuals, um, Peggy being one that's on our team, that um, support our operation on a daily basis. Um, so we're interested in uh, doing a couple different things here. One, evaluating the roles and responsibilities that individuals hold. So I have an assistant, Raina has an assistant, and both of them hold, as you can imagine, dozens of responsibilities and really serve as a catch-all for everything else um, on the downstairs level. We have one person in the personnel function for the entire school district, one person, um, and it's a challenge. And Dr. Kaur oversees the day-to-day -day of all of our certified personnel and um, Ms. Stein oversees um, any um, challenging situations that come up with our non-certified uh, personnel or civil service employees, uh, but it's an area of strain and challenge at times. When we think of our business function, um, Carol has um, an assistant who, again, supports her work, um, has a million different responsibilities, including facility management and facility usage and a dozen other things related to school lunch, our emergency notification system, and the list goes on and on. But she also pro provides assistance to Mr. Knowles, who doesn't have an assistant. And then um, we have a couple, only three other positions that run the entire operation of you know, $62 million. Um, we have one uh, payroll slash benefits clerk. We have one accounts receivable person. And then we have one other treasurer that helps Carol and manage the finances. It's a very, very bare bones operation. Um, and it's a stressful environment. And when we step back and we think about doing long range work like this, um, it's a real challenge because we don't have the time and the resource to be able to do it, even though we have the talent in house, just because of the day to day responsibilities 
um, or, or overbearing. Um, so at times, um, we, we think, you know, we could say pie in the sky, oh, we need this, we want that. But before we get to that point, we want to evaluate roles and responsibilities to see how we could realign um, tasks and duties in, in, within the district office, but then step back to see if there's some missing pieces and gaps. Um, and while not listed on the slide, um, the one area that really stands out for me as an area of need and an area of liability for the district is human resources uh, to make sure that we're doing that well and serving the, the needs of our employees and administering all of our contracts and legal obligations well. So that said, we pivot. We start to think about finances a little bit. And I lifted this slide directly from our strategic plan. And strategic objective number six, which is listed before you, um, has one key action. And that key action is the development and maintenance of a long-range financial plan. And I can say it's been many years since the district has taken a pass at this. And it's a, it's a, a journey that's um, certainly not easy for reasons that Carol's now going to be getting to, to jump into um, because there's many moving parts to this work. So, Carol? It's definitely something that you know we, we look to do. It is a useful tool. Uh, it's not going to be a be all end all, as you know, Dr. Harrison said. It's not something that will guide you for every year going forward. And, and in four years, what we've talked about tonight would come to fruition. Um, that's not what it would do. But it does give you a chance to identify opportunities and look at where you might have some obstacles in the future that you need to plan for ahead of time, so that you can be thinking about it. You know, when I when I work on the financial plan, I, I look at the past. I, look, I studied the past. I studied the, the um, previous years. I got ratios. I got all kinds of great statistics. And often, they don't really help you. So it's kind of sad. You know, like, it's not like pure analytics here where I could just say, oh, this is going to help me predict the future. Too much changes. And, you know, examples would be like pension rates. They're, they're all over the place. And they're big key drivers to our budget. Um, the mix of health insurance. I mean, one year you might have a lot more family. One year you might have a lot more individual. It, the mix changes, uh, how many people are on the waiver. Those things add up. They add up to our district. Um, special ed, you know, d d um, out of district placement. Some year it might be lower, other years it might be more. Kids move in, kids move out. So it's, it's, a, it's a very variable number. Um, other things we do know, you know, the debt schedule, obviously I know pretty far going out now. I know for several, you know, 10, 15 years, as long as our debts are in place. So that, that schedule I know. Um, the contractual salaries for settled contracts, we certainly know that. And when I do this plan, I actually used, I took the time to figure out, you know, all the salaries going forward for the next few years of those contracts that we have settled. And then I made assumptions for the years that we don't. Um, there are some key drivers. You know, I just touched on the pension before. But on the revenue side, it's the tax cap CPI, which is the consumer price index that we're, that we're living with, and, and what's called the tax cap growth factor which reflects the um, growth of building and, I don't know, real estate. It's hard to define it because no one actually can really define it in the state, but it's some number that the um, Office of Budget gives us. It's an interesting number. Actually, it's Office of Real Property Tax that gives us this number. So, you know, right now, this year, we'll be at 1.16, which is a nice number. Anytime you're over one, it's kind of a good thing. Uh, for the most part, we have been around one, but if you're, you know, you never can be below one, I think, but, but you're never really going to get anything um, great from it. But some years, I saw our neighboring district had like 1.03. That's huge for somebody. You know, if you get a 1.03, that's really good. I don't expect that in Irvington, but because we're kind of tight. But there is some new building going on, so we'll see. Um, the tax pack CPI, everybody thinks of the cap as a 2% cap. Well, it's 2% is the CPI number, but that's, you know, again, if it's, if it's, if the CPI this year is going to likely be over two, we'll be stuck at two. There are the years we were below two. Pension, I talked about health insurance costs. Again, it's not just the, the increase in rates, but it's also the mix. If everybody went to family, that's more costly than individual. We're fortunate with Swiss chip that the rates have been pretty good lately. Um, nice chip has gone up a lot. Other individual insurance companies have gone up a lot. Some districts offer multiple plans. 
So that's, you know, that's, that's fairly stable. Utility, that's always, you know, a, a guess. It's, it's one of those things where we've been pretty stable lately, but in, right now we're sort of in a little bit of a down, but um, it could go up any time. You know, it's world events could happen for that. Storms, you know, uh, things happening in, in uh, the Middle East. And transportation contracts, that's another area I was looking at a lot because transportation has gone up a lot. Uh, the contract that we had to rebid last year, we had about a 17% increase. Now, all in all, we're not seeing a 17% increase all in all, but um, individual contracts are getting harder and harder to settle because there's not that much competition for busing, and there's a shortage of bus drivers right now. So it's not that easy for them to uh, to to, to, um, to uh, staff it, so they they're able to the demand is, is outweighing the supply right now. So what I put together and what I'll show in the next next two pages is really more of a conservative approach, but a realistic one, that where we are in the future. So what are some of the assumptions I've made? And uh, next slide. Okay, so it's a little bit small, but you have it in front of you. So obviously the, the, on the tax back growth factor, I know next year is 1.16, and then I just assumed a flat 1%. I, I don't want to presume a lot of growth just because it, could, it might not happen. For the tax cap CPI, I'm, I know it's going to be 2% for next year. I, I'm, I'm fairly certain it won't be out until December or early January, but it, it's, it's running that way. Uh, and I predict it's probably going to go again that way next year. I, I don't see a, a huge change economically. I, I tune into a lot of economic forecasts. Um, and we belong to some subscriptions for that through various memberships we have with um, some of our investment associations. And I, I think that's going to stay. But then I took it down a little just for the future. Okay. Um, state aid, we've been seeing increases, you know, pretty good. It's been all over the place, though. One year it was 13.5 percent, <coughs> then it was 1.9, then it was 13.2. So we've seen things all over the place. A lot of the state aid depends on student placements, excess cost aid things that have happened, expense-based aid, so it's a little bit difficult to predict. So I just threw in a flat 1.5. I, I think that might be a little conservative, but, you know, who knows. Um, and I've kept our appropriated fund balance at the same level we're using currently right now. On the expense side, I've assumed TRS, um, we know that the rate next year is going to be somewhere around 9.5. They haven't come finalized it yet, but it's pre predictably that. Can we just say it's teacher retirement? Teacher retirement system, sorry. TRS is the teacher retirement system for certified staff. Um, and then I think it'll go up a, li a little bit next year because it's looking at a five-year rolling rate of investment. That is what the key driver of that rate is. And the market is a little bit down right now, and one of the good rates is coming off that was dri driving the decrease. Um, right now the market was up today, but the end point in December, and you know markets, you, everybody looks at their own statement <coughs> at the end of the month. It's yeah. one point in time, right? It's not the whole month, but it's one point in time, and that, that one point in time drives so much. It's crazy that the way we, we do our financial statements, but it is what it is. So. So that's, um, that, that could be, I think, going up a little bit. And then I, just to be conservative, I predicted a, a small increase going forward, just to make sure we were going to be you know, covered here. ERS is a little different. ERS is the employee retirement system for our non-certified staff, um, our CSEA, our custodial staff. And there, what's happening is there's a, cha there's a tier mix. There's tiers one, two, three, four, five, and six, and the rates are higher for the higher tiers, and they're lower for the, for the I'm sorry, the rates are higher for the lower tiers, and they're lower for the higher tiers. <coughs> and what that does is it's actually kind of giving us a chance to go down a little bit in my prediction in terms of where the rates are going. Um, generally, the rates are higher, though, than, than the TRS system overall. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe the fund is just a little bit differently managed. It encompasses uh, all kinds of municipal government workers, so it's just a larger fund. And I think also because of the whole impact of retirement age and people living longer is having an effect on the ERS fund. Uh, actually, on both of them. Um, so contractual salaries, I already talked about. I put them in for where I know it, and then I made assumptions for what would be going on the out years. Health insurance, I kept at about 6%. We've seen a little bit lower, and we're seeing a little bit higher on, you know, depending on the, on the actual um, group, you know, plan. Contractual supplies, and, you know, contractual is anything we've, we contract for with vendors, and then supplies. I kept it at one. We, we really haven't seen a huge increase here. It might start to go up a little bit as inflation starts to creep up, so that <coughs> might be a little bit, you know, optimistic, but I think we can contain that. Uh, BOCES, we've used BOCES services a lot, and if it's salary-based, I used a higher number of 3%, and if it was not salary-based, I used a lower number of 1.5, so there's a range there. The can, administrative... Can you just take two sentences and what, say what BOCES is? What BOCES is? Okay, sure. BOCES is the um, Board of Cooperative 
educational services, and it's, it's COSERs or agreements that we make with, with uh, the VOCES, which is a central area, and all schools share the services. So if you're using um, copying services and everybody's sharing it, you get a, a, a discount for doing that. It's, it's a, a benefit. We use it for special ed. We use it for oh, all kinds of things, technology, um, board docs. <coughs> and a lot of the things we do, we run it through VOCES <coughs> to get aid. So there's benefit of doing it that way. And then they also will give you the support. So they'll give you the support hotline or the, that you need. So it, that's the shared component that comes okay. in with it. Um, there's an administrative fee we get charged, though, by VOCES to participate in it. And I do anticipate a very large increase two years from now because they have, um, the government said that they can't have OPEB reserves. They cannot have any reserves. So they've had to slowly add back that amount into the, each year because now they can't, they can't have these reserves. So when they get to the point where they have none left, um, th the full amount of their retiree health will be borne on the districts, the, co uh, the uh, participating districts. So I expect a big number, a big increase in that one year, and I did factor that into this model. Um, utilities, I put as a flat two, special ed tuitions, a flat two, and transportation three. Again, those could go all, could go, kind of go all over the place. Um, I've also made some other assumptions. We've been pretty much spending about $200,000 per year in capital expenses, so I kept that. Our debt service, I know the schedule. We do have some installment debt, which we've used for technology purchases over the years, but whatever money came off of that, we've put it into the technology codes because that's where we, what the money was used for. So instead of borrowing now, we're just putting it in outright purchases. Devices really aren't lasting more than five years, so to, to borrow for it is a, is a stretch. So this is more of a responsible way of, of continuing to support technology. And then there were other one-time adjustments, which I really won't get into detail on, where I would know that I would have to make something that was in the future. So that brings you to the outlook. And I know this is really small on the screen, but um, for those of you who have it in front of you, um, you can see how it, how it looks. But basically, what you really want to focus on is the the line that says surplus deficit, because that's kind of telling you, are we going to be okay? Are our revenues <coughs> going to exceed our expenses? Because that's the goal, right? You can't have expenses that exceed your revenue. So if that's a positive number, you're, you're feeling pretty good going out. And so we, we do have a, a surplus in every year in, in the scenario that I've modeled here. And, um, but it does decrease over time. And part of that is because some of the assumptions where I've lowered <coughs> the revenue assumption at the same time where I've increased an expense assumption means that over time that's going to converge and, and, and create a lower surplus. So that's exactly what's happening there. It's kind of a cumulative effect. So by the, the fifth year of this conservative scenario, we're, we're down to a, a, a very small surplus. This does not assume any new staffing. It just continues people that as they, as they go along. So it's still been a fairly <coughs> healthy position to be in. Thank you. And if I look at it more in detail in terms of the revenues, so you can see, you know, again, we've, we've seen this in every budget presentation. The bulk of our, our revenues are property taxes. That does include about three and a half to four million that, that New York State picks up with STAR. So even though it's a 50, you know, 54, 50, 58, $60 million number, it does get back down by STAR, about three to four million. So um, that piece of it's included in there. Then you've got your other local revenue, which is really, um, you know, your health services that we build out to other districts, tuitions that we take in other students. And hopefully we can continue to do some of that with our excess capacity in the classes that we've built. Um, investment income, so that, you know, the corollary of the market going up is that we've also gotten some better investment income when we have opportunity to do that. We, we maximize that. Um, and then our VOCES rental is in there. So those are the bigger pieces of the other income. But again, that doesn't add up to very much on a percentage basis. State aid is the other piece of it. And that's really all of it. Um, so that's your revenue. So the revenues really are, t are driving everything. You know, in, in, the, in the old world before the tax cap, you could build an expense budget and then kind of hope to build your revenues to, to align with your expense budget. It's the other way around now. You're building your, your revenue budget and then you have to align your expenses. So you can see it's just going up a little bit each year. And then, so you, then you look at the expenses and you know, the same trend is happening. So here, as again, as we talk about in every budget meeting, virtually, you know, 70, 70 to 75 percent of a budget is benefits and, st and staffing and salaries because we're in the people business, so that's appropriate. We need teachers, we need we need clerical staff, we need aides, we need custodians, right? So we need all that. Um, so basically, the salaries and benefits are 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 uh, driving the most of it. 
but then we have our equipment, we have contractual supplies, the debt. Interfund transfers is really just a very small number. It's between our special aid fund for our summer handicap program that we, that we, that we have to provide. And sometimes you know, you'll see some crazy numbers, some percentages that go down a lot or, or up a lot, but sometimes when there's a smaller number, it's, it's, um, it's a little bit difficult to look at it on a percentage basis. And there are times when, our, like with our debt, the principal and interest, sometimes the principal payment might go up, but it, the interest payment goes down or vice versa, depending on the bond. So, so I would look at those numbers in whole. I probably should have grouped them together and would have been made for a better statistics looking at that now. I see that I should have maybe done that. So, um, so that's basically where it is. Again, you know, sometimes you'll see a, small, a bigger increase, like in the benefits where the, the 5.63 in 2020, 20, 20, 20, 21, which is for basically because I've assumed an increase in TRS. So you, you see where the, the different things happen and, and changes occur. So again, this is looking at it on a global level. Um, I can easily make assumption changes so that I can see what ifs if I, when I want to. And I often do that just to, you know, make sh to keep us grounded in, in where we're going. But that's the tool of the long range plan that I wanted to present tonight and um, that's where we're at. Thank you, Carol. You know, the, the beauty of it is what she just references and when we think about um, from year to year as we get uh, more specific numbers. So when we think of this budget year in itself, we think about state aid coming in. We think about other figures that we begin to recognize in our growth factor and CPI and the like. We can plug in real numbers and begin to know what out years will look like. Um, then as we settle employee contracts um, this year, we'll be able to have a better grasp on things in the future. Um, there are those, those question marks, you know, when you think about students with special needs, when we think about transportation, as, as Carol referenced. I can tell you health insurance is a challenge. Being the vice president of our insurance group, um, we actually had an increase a little bit larger than we've seen in recent years of um, a blended rate of around 50%. And, and looking at that, um, this is the one year where the state health insurance plan beat us, but the only way they beat us is they invested um, millions and millions of dollars of reserves and they increased their uh, co-pays like $15 uh, to be able to bring the numbers down uh, to keep membership happy. But they're going to creep right back up knowing what their experiences are. So there's, there's challenges that exist on those fronts. But every single time we get another piece of this puzzle, we'll be able to make adjustments accordingly. And um, the board will be able to responsibly step back and say, well, what if something happens down the road? And what if we have another uh, financial downturn? And what if we don't see the inflation that we anticipate seeing? And we can begin to start to run projections to see what different tax caps will look like in future years, recognizing we're seeing a bit of a turn in our economy right now. Um, so now we have a tool in place that will be able to run a lot of different projections. And as Carol said, this was a conservative model looking at where we are today with a 2% tax cap. And um, as the board knows, this morning I emailed you some of the talking points from the governor's um, budget proposal. And one of the things that he spoke to was making the 2% uh, tax cap permanent um, and doing so through legislation. Uh, so undoing this, um, you know, what we, what we have today, we should anticipate seeing for the foreseeable future. Um, but that said, we know now how we can start to work within the box that has been built for us. Um, so, um, Ends like it starts. There we go. Yeah. Uh, I like how I feel. So, uh, like we're saying, that this has become a part of our regular work. Uh, we're proud of where we've gotten today. Um, there's been a lot of work to get to this point. Um, when we think about all the financial work that Carol talked about, she deserves all the credit. That's her back room. That's her, her weekends doing that kind of work. I can tell you she's not getting it done during the school day. She's doing that late at night, and she's doing it on, on her weekends. And I said that again, her weekends <laughs> to get it done. So thank you, Carol. Um, and then I turn to my colleagues for all your time, your creativity, and your vision um, to help us to be able to formulate all this. Um, but when we look at where we're going, um, as we said annually, we're going to tweak this, and we're going to adjust this based upon what our real-time 
uh, needs are, we'll reprioritize based upon finances, based upon student needs. Um, and each and every year, probably will get a little bit more precise based upon our needs. There's times where we're gonna have things that will be check marks, like, hey, we did that and we're, we're in a good position, or things that are crossed out that we may not need that anymore for whatever the reason may be. But then there's gonna be times we may need to add something to the list and we have to be accepting and understanding of that. Um, our budget proposals are gonna be linked to this kind of work. So when we sit down and we have round table in, the, in a month, when we sit down and have budget conversations throughout the winter and spring, you're gonna see the theme that flows to this, right? And it's everything that we've talked about for the last two, three years. It starts with the strategic plan, it starts with our district goals, it's our theories of actions and everything filters into this work that you see today. Um, and so you're gonna see that connection happen time and time again. Um, and then our proposals, we're committed to supporting them with data where possible and we recognize we're building our data sets. There's times that we can say we, there's gonna be numbers we can put to it and others is gonna be anecdotal. Um, but it's another one of our growing points here in the district and um, that we're proud to say that we're gonna come forward with um, what I believe in, I mean, we we'll take this the wrong way, but to say good arguments for the recommendations that we're gonna be making um, this budget season and uh, other future seasons um, down the road. With that said, Mr. Hanna. Yes. Thank you, all, all, all three of you and, and, and all the administrative council who, who participate in this process. It's, it's something that uh, community members and trustees over the years uh, look forward to seeing and, and here it was and, and it's very impressive. Um, we've tried to do this different ways, but I guess uh, we can just start with um, if someone's ready to jump in and, and ask questions rather than trying to work through the document. But I, I would suggest, I guess, if, if we end up having someone stand up to answer some questions, we might take advantage to piggyback um, so we're not having people sit up and get up and sit down over and over again. Is there somebody who wants to lead us off? Maria doesn't have a voice. You, wanna, you, you should take time to text me your questions, and I can ask them for you. Uh, Brian, would you like to get the questions going? And just uh, so you know that um, if some of the questions that may surface, we may invite some of our colleagues to step forward and, exactly. and, and to help out with answers too. As I'm flipping, someone has something. Well, I would just say just a simple uh, one is, is I really like uh, the beginning and the end where we talk about the, uh, the ability to, to refer to these from time to time. And uh, I guess it would be nice to map out when those times are. Uh, you know, you get excited that, oh, we can check in daily with Carol about what the numbers are. But that would be, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so we don't want to do that. Uh, so, so maybe we want to map out what would be an appropriate uh, time frame for, for when we were doing these check-ins. And similarly with the, uh, the strategic plan, that obviously there's been progress uh, from where we started. And uh, so it would be great to sort of uh, identify that for, for all of us uh, when, when we can anticipate uh, those check-ins. Yeah, so when we go back and, and to your point, when we think about when is appropriate for that and from a strategic plan, like the, the world language component ties directly into it, the financial plan ties directly into it, the survey last spring ties into it. So there's lots of areas where we can point to the progress that we've made in right. the last year related to the plan that I think um, all of us should be proud of because we're all a part of that work. Um, but yeah, no, certainly some, some check-ins related to that would be appropriate. You ready? Yeah. So, okay. is, um, in, in looking at some of the recommendations, are there, you know, ones that you would think are higher priority than others? I, mean, I know it's a hard question. It's a general question, but you know, since obviously it's a, it's a long range plan, and obviously we know this is stuff that's not to be able to be accomplished in one, two, or even three years. But are there you know, particular real pressing needs that you'd want us to focus on most? I think the most pressing need that we would say um, pretty collectively is social worker. I think that that came across loud and clear. And then I think examining across, you know, the social worker would be another K-12 and then we would figure out how to divvy it up. I think then we would need to look across and see what the demands are uh, based on that social emotional piece. I, I think that it's, it's significant um, at every building um, what the administrators are being faced with every day and, and quite honestly what our kids are being faced with, um, which ultimately results in their time, but it's really about how do we support kids. 
Yeah, I, I'd say literally in the last 24 hours, I had a conversation with Dave and David about needs on the campus, a conversation with Joyce about needs at Main Street School, and then not long before coming here, sitting meeting with Deb and Andrea about children's needs at, at their schools. And they're not as simple as of, of so, a simple intervention. It's situations where you have family engagement, family involvement, and things that extend beyond the typical work day. So I would totally second what Dr. Core said. The only thing that I would add as a caveat in sitting here as your superintendent, recognizing beyond that, I always have to put safety and security up there as a, as a priority. Um, and that's something that um, is, you know, and I, and I say that knowing that it's gonna be in a forty to $60,000 range for the shared service without benefits, without long range expenses. It's something that I see as critically important to be able to support the safety of all everybody in the district, and it's something that will actually bring um, a degree of relief to all of our administrators um, in each and every location, um, and especially the, the work that Carol's doing to allow her to dig in and do more, more financial work that's going to help the district in bigger ways. And I guess a follow-up question, You're looking at the PPS part of the presentation, and you know, the looking at new programs, I know one of the things that we talked about last year was uh, by implementing new programs, we're actually able to keep students here and save money by not having a district placement. So I assume that's part of the calculation, that that's one of the things that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, without question. All the time went into that. Yeah, and so in doing so, I looked to, to Gail and Shelley. So not only is it that idea of looking where we have a number of students with need, um, but it, it, it's that idea of where we see evolving needs and, and, and growing needs to be able to foster programs. But if we're gonna do something, we wanna be able to do it well. We're just not gonna commit to say, hey, we have a couple students with needs in this area, let's try to build a program. We wanna make sure we have the, the, the right staff to do it, the resources to do it, because some of them are, are, are very intensive and require specialization that you're not gonna find everywhere. And um, importantly, and it, and it may not come up right away, think about it, but you need the right space to be able to facilitate um, a lot of the special programs that we would contemplate down the road. All right. Yeah, cool. I, I, you know, I, I, um, the conversation, just to tail off on what Brian and you were just talking about, Chris, I mean, we started that conversation a while ago about building a real infrastructure, and so I'm pleased to see that that part of you know that's continuing in the long range planning um, for special education services, et cetera, at all. Yeah. Um, I have a couple questions. Uh, so, one, you may not be able to answer right at this juncture, which is fine, but I would love to see the data to support um, some of these pieces. Uh, for example, you know, campus deans, uh, is there an uptick in, you know, just what the data looks like to support that kind of position? Um, you know, is there an increase in the number of uh, behavior intervention plans? Um, to, to support a behaviorist, et cetera, you know, things to that effect. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I guess I, I, when I look at, um, when I think about uh, technology integration coaches, uh, you know, I, the, the need is not lost on me for support uh, for teachers, especially as we try to implement more modern um, instruments mm -hmm. in the room where people might not be always comfortable using them and to their, to their full advantage. Um, but I, I wonder if that's not something that can be solved by intensive professional development um, in-house through somebody like Jesse or somebody you know, coming in, as opposed to uh, trying to allocate funding for four positions when we're trying to uh, build a foreign language program in early childhood. And maybe some of that, you know, one or two of those positions might be better served in bringing in a foreign language coach of some sort um, to support that work. I mean, just some, that's just the idea of alignment sort of in some of the ass I would love to. Just to clarify, we weren't asked, we're not really asking for four. In other words, I think what we're saying is, uh, let me say it better. I know, like, we didn't think you were going to all turn and say, great, get, you know, let's get on yeah, that higher no, four, but maybe over time, maybe we need one K-5 and one six twelve. I think we were just trying to put it out there that everybody would like one in their building, but the chances of that happening are probably right, Which is why I think the professional development but, internally is probably a better yeah. approach to that, but that's just my opinion. But well, those are my two comments slash thoughts. Okay. And Dave, you'd be right to say that we don't have the data before us, but like, you know, the idea of thinking uh, of a behaviorist, I can look at my colleagues and all their eyes would light up with probably numbers of incidents and challenges and 
And it's not even the numbers that um, we struggle with, it's the extremes of behaviors and needs that, that, are, that are different today that it will be hard to quantify. Pieces of it, we can give you numbers, mm -hmm. but there's other pieces of it that, that, we, that we can't uh, represent, only we can characterize um, in a way that should concern, it should concern all of us. Okay. Yes. Um, I, I wanted to be back on what uh, my colleagues have, have talked about as well, where it, um, it feels sometimes like we talk about uh, social emotional learning and so mental health or mental health prevention and ways to support students in the schools. But it's very hard as I think a, a community member and even as a board member sometimes to get your handle on so the way David describes it as what's the data we can use. I mean it seems like it's a there's maybe work to be done in a future say um, working session like this perhaps something something that we could do that would be um, directed toward all aspects of supporting kids that helps us to understand maybe what best practices are in other in other districts I, I find myself always knowing that we're we're dealing with an area where so we have extreme behaviors we have student privacy and it's very hard to get a handle on it so I guess I would echo what David's saying and I don't want to belabor it but you know when we when we talk about say connecting um, connecting the pressures on, on high school <coughs> students and how we want to, say, change uh, the master schedule for, in part, to better support high school students and reduce stress, I just say, okay, this is, a, this is clearly an issue, but it's hard for us to look at it as a single entity. It gets put in in various places, and yet we are constantly struggling to understand it. So, I'm reiterating, I think, what, what other folks have said. Um, but I'd, I'd love to see it discussed maybe as a, in a, in a different way about programming um, so Just that we understand. The, the, the it is uh, student well-being? Student well-being, maybe, yeah. as, a, as an overall topic. I mean, is there, a way, is there a way to address it that gets at these different pieces and helps us to understand where a behaviorist can play a role, where, um, maybe additional mental health training for individual teachers who see all students, who touch all students might make a difference. I mean, there, are there ways that, short of adding staff, that can be done in the next, in the next few years, say, that can, that can help and support students? I'm, I'm kind of wanting to, wanting to know if staff is the only way as well. And I think you raise a a great point and I can reflect back on our meetings that the idea of, of some of the structures and I look at Dave nodding his head and I look at Tori saying what they do, I look to everybody. Um, but there, you have administrators sitting there with visions for developing wellness centers and wellness programs that are integrated and supported not only by our, some of our existing staff but by some supplementary staff and supplementary services that are based um, so there's ideas out there that we are we are really playing with and tweaking with and we look to partnerships like with groups like I ask and the PTSA to be able to support us and some of the, the seed ideas and the seed funding to get some of these things going um, but there's some some creative ideas out there that will I think we will see take root in, in the coming year uh, to support some of those initiatives so maybe I don't know maybe you said this Chris I'm not sure you know, I think it was really challenging. We sat um, and for really ultimately what resulted in hours with all the administrators um, individually pulling together the ideas. What you're seeing really is a summary. Um, every administrator walked through the door with, as Chris is referencing, with here's what we're thinking and here's like what it would look like. So I think that people would probably welcome the opportunity to share this with you um, in greater detail. Yeah, and I, I think as we maybe explain some of a round table looks like so you know the wellness centers and wellness initiatives are things that are a priority but like when we look at the technology support the one thing that's embedded there is looking at one-on-one -on -one initiatives and and actually having devices and, the, and 
a model that would be evolved and developed potentially through our, our, um, our planning this spring. But every one of our schools talked about having devices available for children. And we haven't talked about the model yet. We haven't talked about kids taking Chromebooks home. Uh, we haven't talked about the exact mix at the elementary school with um, iPads or you know d um, touchscreen devices and, and and tablets and 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 keyboarded devices. Um, but very clearly in our secondary schools, I'm going to tell you that it's a commitment of mine um, and a very strong interest and commitment from our administrative team to look at one-to-one -one initiatives in the secondary schools and quite honestly we're, we're not a far distance away from having a one-on-one -one availability um, and it's something that's attainable and achievable and if you go back to the technology slide you'll see reference uh, to finances and when we talk about equipment and um, infrastructure we've done a really good job in recent years in building a, a technology budget that didn't exist in the past so we've built money each and every year for purchase of devices um, and also purchase of infrastructure components. So that's switches, that's servers and the like. Um, and then when we have monies available, we've relayed upon, you know, grant money. So, you know, over recent years, there's no secret that we've bought hundreds of devices. You can come back to all of our budget meetings and we've talked about it and we've put up all those numbers there. Um, you know, when I go back seven years ago, we had spotty Wi-Fi in this building and that was it. And we look at where we are today, we have Wi-Fi in all of our schools and thousands of devices out there. And, and we're night and day from where we were. Now we need to, 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 to finish that, that work and drive that home. And that's gonna be some realistic experiences of putting, making sure kids have access to a device as needed in class. So, uh, thank you. But also to bring that back to student wellness, maybe the way, same way that there is a technology report and kind of a four-year or an effort to try and look at what's happening on a multi-year basis. Is, is there room to start to think about um, wellness initiatives or, or all of the linked um, student support things in a similar way? Does it, is that a possible um, solution? I had one other question, if I may, on um, instruction on the instruction section and and that would be just um, the, the pieces are it, it's not very big and I guess that says to me when I when I look at it that a lot of what what you wanted to do has already happened as regards STEM um, as regards so I mean I'm surprised almost that there wasn't more coming in so why why would that be well I think because increasing is not only is not always about increasing people it's about redesign it's about redesigning of, of program it's about redesigning of um, courses it's about um, shifting some of the things that we're doing I, and we're not guaranteeing you we're not coming back with other ideas <laughs> um, but I think we were also trying to be practical and realistic to say, I think you see it, the overwhelming need is around this wellness, is around social emotional. I think, um, yeah, could we add a million more courses to the high school? Well, technically, yeah, if we had more people, but I mean, Dave and Matt will talk about, you know, there's also a limit to how many, in a, in a school of our size, how many things you can offer and run. I think we've been spent the last six years rounding out programs at the high school. Um, for years, there was no request for staffing at the high school. So I think you, the board and the community has done a tremendous job supporting so many of our initiatives. I mean, you know, Dr. Harrison just referred to that. The growth in these last six years, and again, like it, it is with much thanks to our board of edu boards of education in these last years, we have, be, we have been able to put so many things back in as well as grow, our, grow new programs. Um, you know, we feel very lucky and I don't know, I guess we could always ask for more, but I think we worked really hard to be thoughtful, to say what's gonna round out our programs, how do we continue to provide what we're providing, expanding it, growing it, but being mindful of, um, there are limits to what can happen for a child in a school day, for, for teachers in a school day, for administrators, and I think we have some pretty big initiatives on the table, so maybe it doesn't look like a long list of asks, 
but I think they're deep. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So um, and focused. I think really tightly focused. Um, so I hope that's what you're seeing as well. I think you said that so well, Dr. Okay. Corr. Um, okay. You know, one of, one of the things that we've heard a lot about is how to do things differently. And I think Raina spoke to that. It's just not adding. It's that how do we reinvent, redesign? And we've done a lot of that. We think of the English electives, for example. We introduced a whole uh, array of interesting English electives that reinvigorated our English program. Um, there's going to be other opportunities like that. When we think about the idea of shared staff, part-time staff, and we, when we look into that, there's going to be opportunities there. Maybe there's a point two or a point six that we add in math or social studies to middle school, high school. Well, not only does that begin to solidify a department, have continuity from staff from year to year, but it may introduce that opportunity by adding a component of a staff, like a point six or a point two. Um, it may introduce that opportunity for another elective or two. Um, so that, that is there too. Um, and that's a part of that kind of generic reference of the evaluation um, that we talked about earlier as well. Can I just share one example? Because I think sometimes we don't go backwards. So I think that a reflection of the work of the, over these last six years, especially with PLTW, today um, we did our final training of a our Amplify Science at the elementary with the fourth and fifth grade teachers. So now K through five, each grade level of teachers has gone through training. And they're piloting these units. And we started the conversation, obviously, because we're going into budget season. Um, what are we going to do for next year? Are we looking to do another Amplify unit? Is that what we want to do? So we started the conversation. And one of the really, I thought, um, poignant moments was when we highlighted that through PLTW, we are meeting a whole body of the science standards. So our kids are now engaging in Project Lead the Way. We're meeting some of those science standards. Therefore, our classroom teachers at the elementary, who are so pressed for time at the elementary level, are now, we're looking at, well, how many science units will we have to do in a classroom? Oh, you know what? Our classroom teachers aren't going to have to do four science units because we're meeting the need of both our STEM focus and initiative as well as the new science standards through the combination of Project Lead the Way and, and this new science program. And that was a vision that we had four years ago and when we launched Project Lead the Way, knowing eventually New York State would adopt these standards. Um, so New York State went ahead, they finally adopted them. We had Project Lead the Way in place. Last year we were able to expand K2. So when we look at this, you see like the fruits of our labor. This work we have been, this work we have been doing, building, it's there, it exists, and it takes time, but we really see now those connections are being made, and it's gonna benefit um, our classroom teachers, because it is a lot for them to be learning three new science units. Like, so in, instead, we didn't have to layer it in that way. We're able to do a slow growth, where this year we piloted one Amplify unit, now we're gonna examine it, we're being thoughtful, we're being reflective, and we're being practical at the same time. And, and I think that's a sign of good planning, whether it be <coughs> instructionally, financially, however we're going about it, to me it reflects planning. I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I, Beth said it was okay if I jumped in. Because um, I was gonna ask about that. Like I, I noticed the absence of anything. Is that a message that we're getting? That it's not something that's gonna be looking looked at in the future to go deeper with? What do you mean? Amplify. But this, was a, this, this is staffing. Just staffing. Today. No, the, the, the instructional part is just about staffing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Can I ask a staffing question about foreign languages before I hand over to Beth? Um, so, French and Spanish for elementary world language proposal um, makes sense, matches what's already in place um, in the upper schools. But um, will the teachers be able to so cover each other's classes, or would there be any possibility if? If a Spanish teacher is ill in the elementary school, what happens? So I'm, I'm looking at, are they, if, would it be possible to find folks who are duly certified if you're looking for a full-time person? I mean, is that, how do you, how do you kind of make it? Yeah, you wish for that. Um, you do. <laughs> you do. I mean, you know what? I, it's not that often you find them, but we do um, have, there are, we have one teacher who is um, both Spanish and French. Um, you know, I, I think once we see where this proposal goes, then the next um, challenge is staffing. 
the feedback that we got from our um, neighboring districts um, who are implementing language, their greatest challenge is actually finding certified staff. Um, so that would be our next, the next step in our journey, um, should world language move forward. Um. Thank you. I think uh, one of the most interesting parts of this uh, presentation was like the difference between sometimes shared can be a good thing and sometimes it can be a bad thing. So it was very helpful to hear about how sharing staff among the buildings or across the campus loses us time and efficiency in ways that I, I hadn't been aware of before. But in looking at some of the suggestions, I understand this is a pie in the sky presentation. And you know, we're stuck with the reality of something that's called a 2% cap, but at any time can go anywhere below 2%, even in 2016 to a negative number. And we have to realize that that can happen, although we're right now at a point where inflation is actually allowing that number to go up. Um, I was wondering, in terms of sharing kind of responsibilities going to the focus on athletics, when you talk about providing more educational programming through a full-time district employed athletic trainer, is that aspirational, hoping for a athletic trainer who is also able to teach outside of the student athlete mode, or is providing educational programming to student athletes? To me, it would be related to student athletes. I, I think the latter stands out. Um, we want to we want to educate our our student athletes to to be to be safe. We're going to speak to student wellness, right? So there's going to be all education in and around fitness training, nutrition, and we think that there's opportunities that will then grow to the general student body and population related to those initiatives. Uh, but the focus would be the care and the treatment of our student athletes throughout the school day. But I think there's going to be plenty of opportunities for engagement with the general student population as well. Right. So in a way that becomes almost like a shared educational service that might be usable. And in the same way, I'm just wondering, like when you talk about campus dean advisor and behaviorist, I think there may be some overlap there. And is it possible that someone in that position could... Because what I'm concerned about is we have another unfunded mandate from the state about mental health education. They want us to provide it. They are not funding it. That's right. So would that also be an area where possibly there could be, I know we use push in in another context, but for the purpose of this conversation, to go into the classrooms or it's, it would be a fully administrative role? Well, and I want to be careful about the word administrative. So like, if we're going to yeah, talk about um, the campus dean positioning. Yeah, that. To, that. Yeah. You know, there are lots of models out there for this. There are models where um, you have a teacher, maybe a teacher who doesn't have a full load of schedule and then does deaning for a couple of periods a day. I think that often is a flawed model because, you know, you can't predict that third period I'm teaching and now something happens and now. So I'm not sure that's the model we're looking at, but there are different models of, 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 of dean. They're not always, there are, at times, teacher on special assignment, they are not administrator jobs necessarily either. Oh, no, I meant more in terms of, you know how our guidance counselors will actually also go into the classrooms to educate Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, yes. Yeah, I meant in that context. Um, I don't know, like, that's an interesting question at the secondary level. Um, mm -hmm. I would say, I, I think we'd have to look at what the options are. You know, one of the things that all of our administrators spoke about, but certainly our campus administrators, is is this whole idea of wellness, is this being proactive? So I would like to say that our goal would be to be proactive in all areas and so that we're educating our students and before and not reacting, right, that we're developing. But I would say generally a campus dean is somebody who would be um, providing the support when a student engages in some sort of disciplinary um, infraction. But I will say, and I think I say this from my own experience, those moments as administrators, when you are sitting in your office with a student who has done something that is, has gone awry from the norm, it is at those moments where you are working most closely with that student and their family to try and troubleshoot what is going on. And sometimes it's something that's going on actually for the family. So at that moment, you might that's where you might link in Gina Menendez, the social worker. So in each and every instance, you are navigating what is happening for that particular child. And there's such a range of what happens for us when we're working with kids 
So I wouldn't want to target it or say what it is right now. Sure. I think what we would say is if that's something, a direction we're going to go in, I think there would be a ton of conversation around why, what is it, and, and ultimately how does it support both the reactive, because we need some of that, but also the proactive. Right, and there's also a linkage here, and I just want to point it out. Um, Deb Hargrave wasn't able to be here tonight, but we had gone to a New York State School Board Association meeting specifically on campus safety, and they were actually moving away from a focus on hardening campuses, which is still very important, but to the SEL issue, uh, the associate, I'm sorry, social, emotional, social emotional learning, learning issue, to being very important in ensuring the safety of our students. So that leads me to my final question. I'll stop talking, which is, when we talked about the district-wide safety coordinator, I was wondering if you could share, I don't know if you can, what other districts are contemplating having a conversation about shared services. Um, that was something you had touched upon. So, um, interestingly enough, so the, uh, I, when you're talking about the, the social-emotional learning and building networks in and around that, it sounds like you were sitting at our I Ask meeting this morning as I look to Dave and David, um, because that was a lot of the focus of the conversation in and around building infrastructure and support models there. Um, when we think of this particular position that, that I referenced, uh, I prefer not to say the individual districts because I don't know what conversations the superintendents or business officials have had with their boards of educations as of yet, but I would tell you that they're districts that are in um, very close proximity that would permit the level of sh um, sharing that wouldn't result in tremendous lost time. That would be, that would be really amazing. Um, and then it's also possible that with community mental health, which is county community health, where Michael Orth is commissioner, you might be able to get additional help on that. So look forward, forward to hearing more. I just want to add one last thing, because I, I think it was rem I was remiss in not saying it. I, I really want to take a moment also to highlight the work that is currently being done, because there isn't a building that isn't actively um, working toward supporting our students um, in this way. So it's not like we're just waiting, and I know you're not saying no, no, that, no, no, but, but the I'm really saying it's the are benefit strained. Of, of, of the board and the community. Um, there is proactive um, actions going on in every building. So this is really something that we're looking at. How do we build? How do we strengthen it? Um, but it, I just felt like it was worth just mentioning that. I think you all do know it, but everyone knows that, and that it's we're trying to provide even more and take some of the strain off of people exactly. so that they can get to their other duties. And, right. yeah. and, and, I'll, and I'll say that oh, I'll just say the same thing with the security. There's a lot of technical things that have to be done, and even though you know you're getting away from the school hardening, there's things that we have to do. And, and that technical person will be able to say, okay, you know, they, they can tell us what to do, but then someone still has to go and do A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And it has to be a priority to do all those things. And if it's not, you know, and B doesn't get done, you know, that's, that's bad. So we, we really need to, that, that's the technical part of it. So that's why we're advocating for it as well. So yeah, it's a really a combination of everything. Thank you. Yeah, one of the things I, uh, I like to share, or uh, you know, think about with community members when I'm talking with them is just the expectations we have on you in terms of being expert in everything and it's, it's a very demanding role uh, and, and I appreciate the efforts you, you make to, to uh, there's your areas uh, in which you were trained and, and, and have lots of experience and then there's constantly new things being thrown at you that uh, you're, you're adapting and adjusting and, and we, we bring in people that, uh, that can support that, that growth. Um, but, you know, I, I always joke that, uh, you know, where's your meteorology degree? Uh, because, uh, you know, just the, the range of, of, of things that we expect. So uh, I thank you for uh, just the, the amazing work that you all do uh, day in and day out uh, because it's, it's not insignificant. Um, and, you know, having, having been uh, someone who was in the audience for a number of years before I was here, uh, initially it was quite a mystery as to how uh, decision making uh, was made so uh, I think uh, you know, a lot of the work we've been doing, and particularly this, this uh, document, is very helpful for people uh, who would like to get a, sort of a big picture view of, of some of the trends uh, for, you know, going forward for the district and in more concrete ways than they might have had in the past. So really appreciate that. Uh, it's really Maria's turn for, for questions, but, but her, I see her question sort of rolls into mine. She also thanks you uh, if she had her voice. Um, 
So I'll try and unpack my, my dense notes here. Um, just my back of the napkin number, but I don't know, we can check this, is that from our low of <coughs> personnel, uh, that maybe we've added 10 or 12% from that time, that uh, you know, maybe it was 50 employees or something like that in both construction and, and staff. Yeah, we actually, I would say that early on, my first few years, um, I like to tell a story of, of the reductions that took place historically right. in the district, and we wanted to move away from that. Mm -hmm. We didn't want to work from a deficit model. We wanted to start to become visionary, mm -hmm. and we didn't want to talk about what was. We wanted to talk about what we wanted to be, so we pivoted from that. Um, so that's actual data that we could go back and, and, and provide that we have taken quite a shift. and. Yeah. And they would say there's positions that we could say that, but we would say we've added. But then there's many positions that we'd say we've restored. Right. And then I would differentiate among those. And, and right, right. There, there, mm -hmm. we, we, had, we had more, it went down, and, yeah. and it went back up. And so some are restoring and some are. Yeah, I remember a list that for some reason the number 44 stands in my mind. Yeah. And I, I think that's in the ballpark. Yeah, in the, 44. In we, we added more last year, so that's why I rounded it up to. Yeah, to and, yeah. and I know, you know, going back to last year's budget, I, I know we added four or five. Yeah. Um, positions related to, to, to district initiatives. Um, so we, we, we have been on a path, but that path has been deliberate and, and, and very targeted. And, and it started restoring the basic principled experiences we believed our children should have. And then it shifted to the vision of what we wanted for our children. And, and I think Raina articulated that before very well in talking about PLTW and how that's supporting science. We're talking about visionary needs related to social emotional learning, and we're being realistic. Mm -hmm. We could step back and say, you know what, we want to add this program, we want to add that program, but we know that there's only so much we can fit into a school day. We know we only have so many classrooms, and I, and I do want to touch on the classroom piece for a second, but I, there's only so much that is reasonable to think that we should be able to raise in taxes. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we want to try to balance all of those pieces. You know, when we talk about high school and high school programs, classroom, middle school, all of our schools, classroom limitation is, is realistic. And, and modernization of spaces is important for us in, in the bond and, and something that we look forward to talking about more extensively. Um, but one of the challenges that we have at the high school is that it's a great resource to host the BOCES program that's present because we have many students that move in and out of the program and do so at limited, if no cost, to the school district. Um, but there's also valuable square footage that could be utilized for high school space. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a give and take there um, that, that, that's a part of this bigger equation that, that we have to wrestle with as well. So, uh, I mean, and I think for, for those of us who, who've tracked the, you know, the, the, the changes over the, the past few years, uh, you know, so we're around 500 uh, personnel, including uh, our instructional staff and our, uh, is it 200 uh, in, in IFA and then another 300 uh, in ballpark? 203, I think, right? Yeah. So, so this pie in the sky number is, represents about 5% of that number, um, so it's it's good to, to to get a sense finally of. I want to say I, I just want to correct you. I don't have an exact number. I want to say we're like three twenties. We have like three hundred and something employees. No, is it is a hundred plus two? Yeah, it's a hundred something oh, plus. I have to redo my numbers there. Yeah, it's, no. I want to say three. <laughs> it's twenty. Yeah. I thought I thought we had. Uh, yeah, I was at, okay. I added the, the the total number to the IFA number and ended up with a huge number. Okay, my mistake. I'm very tired, so. Please forgive me. Um, so then, let me redo those numbers. But so the percentage is even the right. Yeah. So the so what that equals out then is it's a three twenty, right? It's probably be. a little bit more than three twenty. I the exact number I don't know, but maybe three thirty, something like that. So it was a twenty percent increase over then, and then that would be. Uh, it's not all in one year. No, no, over that <laughs> time. <laughs> And okay, yeah, well, and then and then we're, it's more like an eight percent in terms of uh, what we're talking about here. So I mean, it's just be, before this presentation, I wouldn't have been able to have a guess as to what we're we're looking at. So now it gives some figures to what what it would be if we had all the different things that you've thoughtfully considered would would round out. 
the needs of the district. I, I think in terms of what Laura uh, just shared in, in her question, the dialogue we had was that, um, you know, it does seem like, uh, other than the area I'll touch on subsequently, that uh, instructionally we're getting to a place where you're feeling comfortable <coughs> in terms of what you were just saying, what we can <coughs> offer. Um, but during that same period, I, I, you know, I, I appreciate the effort by, by our administrators, by, by the district to also increase, increase the supports for that, uh, that social emotional well-being. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily feel like we can catch up to that in the same way, that we're still trying to chase how we can improve that. And I, I, I think you know, we've heard from uh, Principal Cohen that, you know, in some ways it's structural, that you know, we have to change the way we, we do business, uh, that we, maybe we can't just keep adding it's not only adding people that will help us with that. And, um, and so that's, uh, I think, an important uh, aspect for us to reflect on. And Michael, just yeah. on that, um, the shifts, like I, I guess I, I just want to give another example because I think it's a good context. I, right now at Main Street School, I mean, Main Street School has an art teacher who's shared. They have a music teacher who's shared. You know, so that's why, again, it's not so much it, the adding. It's, it, it's the importance of the shared staff and yeah. having the right staff. Yeah. You know, making sure that we have a te teachers who are elementary teachers, not just, you know, teachers who can be bounced around. They have expertise. So I guess I just wanted to add that, that it's not, I don't know where how you put that. In the end, it would be more teachers, but it's not <coughs> because we need to do something more. It's actually because of the current situation. Yeah. So. Well, thank you for that segue. That's exactly where I wanted to go with it. So that's, yeah. that's great. Is, uh, is I think, uh, I could sense a lot of interest from the board when you dug into that a, a bit because uh, that shared uh, staff uh, seems to unlock a lot uh, if we were to have a different approach. And so I think uh, I, for one, and, and I, I'm sure some others uh, here would be interested to, to see that unpacked further, uh, that what does that do uh, in terms of, you shared uh, on different occasions the process for hiring, you shared a little bit uh, tonight and it's it's significant the hiring process and we appreciate it because you end up with really great uh, folks working here in the district mm -hmm. but to have to do that on a recurring basis uh, for for folks who are rotating uh, out and, and we're having to hire new is, is, is significant uh, certainly uh, when we talk about point ones I mean it sounds like we're losing point ones and transporting people back and forth from uh, schools so I'd rather have those people working than uh, driving a car back and forth uh, so, so uh, the, there's a lot to unpack there, uh, and, and I just wanted to take a turn with it as well, and, and it covers uh, the interest of, of I think, uh, several trustees, including Maria, um, in terms of uh, that shared staff. That, uh, and I guess this would be a question for e for either uh, Mr. Sotal or Mr. Cohen, is do you have a number in terms of the, n the number of, of shared staff you have between your schools? Yeah, we keep a staffing document, yeah. so we go through shared staff. So it's not just it's not just middle school, high school. Yeah, but I mean, I'm asking specifically middle school, high school. If there's a number, and maybe that's something. If you don't have it off the top of head, uh, uh, we'd be curious to to hear. It. Uh, you know, in ballpark is it five? Is it ten? It's between five and ten. Yeah, um, I mean one. Observation, uh, just uh, because I've passed through recently and know a number of students, uh, and, and I'd love to, to hear if I'm, I'm off base, is that you know, eighth grade and, and ninth grade uh, really uh, is uh, an interesting time in the, in the life of an Irvington student because uh, you're, you're making the transition into being a high school student. The, the, the course load uh, is, is, can be much more challenging for certain students. And, and I wonder if that's also a period that where we see more um, stress from students, uh, perhaps relative to other times. Uh, I mean, I'm sure at all grades there is some amount, but if with eighth grade, because of the less flexibility with schedule, more demands, is that, you know, and, and so that transition, is that perhaps a, a period of particular challenge for, for students? Dave, could, I'm sorry, could you go to the mic, please? I think that we've known for a long time that the eighth to ninth transition for students is is a particular challenge um, for you know any number of developmental reasons as well as academic. Um, so there's no question that that's a time where uh, we want to pay close attention to the social emotional needs of students along with the academic. Okay, 
Um, and so, I, you know, I, I, we, we know this is, uh, you, the, there are a number of opportunities for community members uh, to, to learn more about uh, the schedule change, but when we talk about structural change, I, I think uh, I've heard other trustees ask, and, and I'd like to, to ask it again, that, um, you know, in what I think a lot of us have found value with the proposed high school change is, is the, the benefit uh, for the 9th through 12th students. Uh, we're curious about, uh, excuse me if I must, uh, must speak for some of you, uh, about you know, what can be done for those 8th grade students. You know, is there a consideration for middle school uh, and changing the structure there? And one of the things that we've heard before is that one of the issues with uh, when you gave a wonderful presentation, uh, Principal Cohen, last year about the two models you've been looking at at the time, drop versus block, was that the shared staffing uh, presented a, a problem in implementing drop. So I, I just wonder if, uh, if we addressed, I mean, when we talk about all the things that can be unpacked by addressing shared staffing, uh, if this is one thing that you, you might take a look at uh, as well, because uh, I would say that the response that a lot of us heard was that there was a lot of interest in drop, and if, if it's really about shared students, uh, shared staff, um, you know, if it does all these other things too to, to address the shared staffing issue, that's something I think the board would be very interested in, in learning more about. Uh, and then again, if we're hearing that eighth grade to ninth grade transition is one of those most challenging periods, shouldn't we be including some sort of structural change to, to address that challenge? I leave that so thought for you to consider. Answer. We have 20 staff members who are shared not only campus, but mo mostly campus. Um, but I, I guess I just feel like, I'm just worried a little bit around, that feels like a slippery slope around trying to meld in the, this idea of a different scheduling model into this. I mean, some of these staff members, it changes from year to year. It, it's, not, it's just not so simple, so it feels like we would need to give you a lot more information mm -hmm. um, in order well, to I think, really I think, I think that's what's really uh, been intriguing for me tonight is, is hearing uh, you know, I think we're, we're always looking for, uh, or listening for what uh, are uh, interesting ways to, to, to see things differently, and, and what you shared was very interesting because uh, uh, sometimes we, uh, we try and find economies and instead we're creating more challenges for ourselves. No question. Uh, and I think that was very interesting. So I don't, there, that's not, a, yeah, I mean it really is a question that, that you know, there was all these opportunities that, that you shared uh, that I think are very interesting for for trustees to consider. Um, do you want me to ask this more specifically? I think, no, okay. The, um, and I think, you know, again, I, you, you uh, sort of uh, discovered something very interesting there, Maura, in, in ask, and, and Brian as well, with asking the question of what is, is topmost on, on your minds. Uh, and we're trying to rethink, uh, hopefully together, uh, this round table in January. So I think that's an interesting discussion for us as we think about uh, planning that discussion is that, um, you know, is there a way to look at it more globally uh, that, that there is this interest in, in, in having the, the additional social worker, there is this interest in the structural changes and, and what are the, all the different pieces that can come together more comprehensively to really address uh, what we all are concerned about which is student well-being. Um, so, I, I, you know, there's a lot to be gained by reflecting on this presentation and, and I thank you for that. And I'll leave it at that. I just want to clarify one of yeah. my questions before, man. When you said it's about staffing, I want to rephrase my, my, my suggestion. Because it might be prudent to think about a, a science cluster teacher at the elementary level. No, no need for response, just, to, just clarifying my statement. That's your time. Thank you. Uh, so we want to give opportunity for community members if they have questions related to uh, this presentation. If you could just share your name, and uh, we ask that you keep your comments or questions to about three minutes. Hi, I'm Erin Bernstein. I'm the parent of a third grader at Dow's Lane. Um, I'm all yours next year, Joyce. Get excited. Anyway, <laughs> I do want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to the district and to everyone on the World Language Committee for the thoughtfulness that went into the proposal. I'm a little concerned seeing Carol's financial plan that only has about $250,000. Or, no, I'm not concerned. I'm selfishly happy that we're going to get about 200000 of that two fifty that she has left in there. <laughs> the power of positive thinking. Um, <laughs> uh, in all seriousness, though, um, 
I, I know a lot of time went into this. I also want to thank Yasin and Lorraine who couldn't be here tonight. Yasin's, Yasin was at the airport picking up a family member, so I know she really wanted to be here, and I was texting her all the good news. Um, sorry, I'm just going through. I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to try to focus on foreign language. Um, I do have, I guess, one question I had. So we're looking at the flex model, which we did want flex, but I'll take flex. Um, because it is $200,000 to do K through five flex, is there thought as we approach the budget season of doing flex in you know, third, fourth, and fifth or on a smaller scale so that at least we could start to introduce it and then maybe push it down to the lower grades um, or vice versa? I don't know which makes more sense. Um, I'm the parent of a third grader, so three through five I really like. <laughs> <laughs> put a lot of time into this. Right out there, right? I'm, I'm right. honest. I'm nothing if not honest. Let's just face it. But if not, that's fine. I'm happy for the other kids. But is that a thought at all? Or it, because the proposal is K through five, it's not an all or nothing as we approach. Okay. No, and I mean, I, I, we, when the committee did this work, we certainly expected that there would be, that question would be posed to us by the board and we would okay. be, and we would have to hash out you know, what the possibilities are, so. Okay, and then what, I guess, because I know scheduling is really hard in the elementary schools, what's being given up or what's the trade-off to putting in the foreign language program? Because obviously I'm concerned about all of the education, so I just want to understand that better. So this is, a, this is a really good example of what somebody might call a byproduct. We would actually call it working toward our goals, um, a, a common set of goals. So when the World Language Committee had the conversation um, and felt that the best proposal would be in the special, what it would open up for us is library. Tissue. And you know, there's so much work for us to do around inquiry and there's so much um, work for us to do in developing our social studies curriculum. And so our goal would be to um, have library as a more open environment so that our students and our librarians could be working and partnering with teachers. So let me shift gears. So this is when you talk about planning and how things can unfold and we talk about technology and we talk about instructional coaches and we talk about, there is overlap there. There is the opportunity for our library media specialists to provide technology integration around research, around inquiry, around teaching thinking. So that's another good example of, we don't know that the answer is a technology coach, but what we know is we need to increase, we wanna have integration of technology in our classrooms. So right now, the proposal would be that our, libra our libraries would open up and that we would be, have our librarians co-teaching and partnering with our classroom teachers, which would allow us to implement an, an approach to inquiry that we right now have not been able to launch just yet. So that would happen just during the normal course of the day then, as opposed to library being a special? Is that right. what you're saying? Okay. Oh, that's so if I'm a teacher and I'm in the middle of my social studies unit, I'm working in the library with the librarian oh, right. um, on research, on inquiry, and, um, and again, I mean, so much work around our, our global connects, um, into connecting with people in other countries. There's so many connections we could make if that door would open up. Oh, that's interesting. I like that. So in, in some great. ways, like, we would be, it, we'd be getting, like, two for one. Hey, it sounds like a win-win, doesn't it, everyone? Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry. I had one other question. I have lots of questions, but I'll, I was just curious, as we talked about the technology, is it coaches? I'm, excuse me if I'm using the wrong term. Um, I am curious, as we look at these initiatives, how that's also intersecting with the, um, oh gosh, what's that community? We have the new community group that's looking at tech and screen time in the elementary schools. So how is that intersecting? Is because there is more focus on screen time at the, especially, I mean, at all levels, but definitely the K through six as we talk about BYOD and all these other things that I've learned about so on I your own device. So. We would actually, <laughs> if, we were gonna, if we were gonna put that under an umbrella, I think our umbrella for that would actually be wellness and would be that learning around, you know, years ago maybe it was DARE, whether it was effective or not, you know. But for me, it's that same vein, having a guidance counselor or two at our elementary schools. So some of that, I was because I was thinking the same thing when I saw that group com coming together. Where does that live? Well, it lives really in the opportunities, and that's where we could be proactive, right? That's where we could be engaging. We could be engaging in instruction and lessons and talking about that whole level of technology that are, it's just the reality for our students. Um, but that would be a definitely one entry point. I don't, that is not what we mean when we talk about coaches. When we talk about technology coaches, we are talking about the partnering around instruction. In other words, 
making what we're doing now look different, whether that be in social studies, science, mathematics. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. It's, it's really about supporting the use of technology in the classroom by teachers. It, exactly, in content, right. through the content, I would say. Great, um, thank you. And can I ask one more question? I'm gonna piggyback off of what you asked. Um, you had asked how many shared positions there were, and I think I heard 20. I was curious also, how many part-timers do we have in the district? Do we know that answer? Two or three. Okay, so it's it's well, small then. Teaching. 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 We have teaching. many aides that are part-time. Okay, so when you talked about the part-time staff, was it related to just the teaching staff, or was teaching it, staff. it teaching staff? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, again, thank you. I mean, I think it was incredibly informative. We appreciate the participation of, of the administrators, and uh, we look forward to, to seeing you in the new year. We wish you a happy new year and a happy holidays. Yes, happy holidays to everyone, please. Thank Enjoy you your families. Everyone. So we have a consent agenda and uh, includes uh, adopting minutes. Uh, we have a, a, a new treasurer uh, that would be appointed and uh, some other staff uh, changes. Can I get a motion to accept the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Okay, so Beth and, and uh, Dave, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you so much. Um, and I just I want to get back into a habit that comes and goes with the board, but uh, you know at the end of meetings if they're uh, sort of it's it's late, so I, I would encourage us not to to get too uh, excited with it the idea. But if there are any other items that you'd like to raise, um, you know I want to give you that opportunity. So I didn't preview for you this year or this meeting, so and this year because the next time we meet it'll be next year. Uh, but uh, I, I would like to try and bring that back in terms of our meeting. There are items that you'd like to, to raise briefly at the end of a meeting uh, that there will be that opportunity. Uh, so with that, uh, our next meeting is uh, in the new year, January 8th, uh, 2019, uh, here in the campus presentation room. And with that, could I get a motion to adjourn our meeting? So moved. Second. Second. So Maura and Dave, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Aye.